We're going to do a semi-new song. I know we sang the chorus here, but uh, before that, I wanted to say something um, from John. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a hu husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Amen.
So let every knee come bow before the King of Kings. Let every tongue confess that He is Lord. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing. Holy, holy, we cry out, holy, we're singing, holy. Let's sing that out. No hell, King Jesus. No hell, the Lord of heaven and earth. And no hell, King Jesus. And no hell, the Savior of the world. And no hell. King Jesus, and all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, and all hail King Jesus, and all hail the Savior of the world. Amen, amen. Please turn your attention to the baptismal. Hey, everyone, hear me? Or no? Should I hold it? Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Mariah, and uh, this is a really good friend, family friend of mine, Aaliyah. And um, I met Aaliyah earlier this year, and she came to me as a, a student for um, horseback riding, so I've been teaching her how to ride horses for the last um, 12 months or so. And um, we became really close. She became a really close friend of the family, and um, she started coming to church with us. And um, um, I've been coming here for a few years with my family as well, and I've known Pastor John for years since I've been in middle school. So, um, Aaliyah is really close friends of, of our family, so 
we were just speaking in the back about how um, amazing it was that um, I was able to be um, baptized in the church that um, Pastor John started in at Downey First Baptist, and he's kind of like a second dad to me, and she's kind of like a second year or like a second daughter to me. So he was talking about how you know baptism should be um, generational, and that's exactly what it is. So um, I'm really proud of her for um, for making this statement today, and um, it's it's a huge honor for me to be able to baptize her as well. This is something I've never done, and. Um, she's very special to me, and um, she's she's worked really hard, and she's you know been really um, she's giving her heart to God, and it's it's something that's uh, that hits really close to home for me. So um, really happy to be here, and um, yeah, let's uh, let's do this. <laughs> happy <laughs> <new day. laughs> okay. Questions. Uh, have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Is it your decision to follow Jesus in the act of baptism? Yes. Will you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, follow Jesus all the days of your life? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, with that being said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. up and greet your neighbor and tell them Merry Christmas. That was a little bit sweeter than our normal hi to everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? You guys, I like to see all these boys up here. Usually there's way more girls than boys. So I'm glad the boys are up here representing. So, oopsie, did we drop it? We got it? All right. Um, just a quick reminder for you guys, uh, the youth are selling car wash cards to go to camp, and camp is amazing. So if you can help them out with that. I know some of you already have, so thank you, on behalf of the youth. And then um, still the opportunity to purchase a Bible for the Good News Club uh, at Park Ridge Elementary. If you want more information on that, you can see Venus, because she kind of heads it up her in Elaine, and you can see Melissa to purchase the Bible. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Mrs. Kelly for a moment. All right, you guys. Last week, we learned about what, who remembers? It was only seven days, guys. <laughs> a candy cane. A candy cane, the true story of a candy cane. Now, let's see. You guys were supposed to give your candy cane to someone. Did you guys do it or did you eat it? Raise your hand if you ate it. <laughs> Wait, put your hand down. You were supposed to give it away. Okay, raise your hand if you gave it away. Okay, who wants to tell me who they gave it to? Stella wants to tell me. Okay, hold on. There's a lot of kids today. I gave it to my tia. A tia is an aunt in Spanish. <laughs> who else? Who else wants to tell me what they, who they gave it to? Did you eat it? Oh, was it yummy? Okay, as long as it was yummy. Who else gave it away? Nobody? Some of them are probably under your bread and you totally forgot about them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, who remembers though, if we flip the candy cane upside down and the hook is at the bottom, what does that mean? Let me go. Maddie, what does it mean? J for Jesus. A J for Jesus. And when it's upright, what does that mean? What does that stand for? I'm going to go over here to Chevelle. I'm going to get my workout in, guys. A uh, shepherd's cane. A shepherd's staff. It's the same thing. <laughs> and why is that important? Why are the shepherds important in Jesus' birth? It's because um, they pull away the sheep with the staff. <laughs> but why do the shepherds, why is that important in Jesus' birth? Because the shepherds were the first ones to know Jesus was born. The shepherds were the first to know that Jesus was born. Now, two more questions. The colors on the candy cane, what are they? Everybody. 
Red and white. Okay, what does red stand for? I'm going to ask a boy. Wait. What does red stand for? Blood. Blood? Well, whose blood? My blood? No, Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood that he shed for us. And what does the white stand for? I'm going to ask Colton. His body. His body? Not quite. Let me go over here. His, the blood wiping away from from his skin. Yeah, it's our it's our sins that are forgiven, right? Right, and we become white and pure again. Bless you. You guys remember? Yeah. Good job, you guys. Very impressive. Um. Okay. So next week we are celebrating a birthday. Do you know whose birthday it is? Is it somebody up here? Jesus' birthday. Yes. I'm so excited. So we all get to go to a birthday party next week. Do you guys want to go to a birthday party? Yeah. I'm glad one of you does. That's good. What about the rest of you? What? Tell me, like two of you, tell me what is your favorite thing about going to a birthday party? What is your favorite thing mm, to do at a birthday party? What do you think, Colton? Play. Play. Play, okay, playing is fun. Yes, Ava. Have candy. Oh, yes, okay. Oh, we'll, we'll have more of you say. Piñatas. Piñatas, okay. Food. Food, yeah, those are, that's always fun. A cake. A cake, should we get a birthday cake for Jesus? I think we should, yes. Birthday cake. Yes, should we blow out candles? Mm, okay, I'm excited. We need to start getting really excited about Jesus' birthday. All right, yes, Jolene. Singing happy birthday. Oh, very important. That's almost the most important part, right? All right, who wants to pray before we head over to class? Where are we going today? Dear Jesus, I hope you have a... Dear Jesus, I hope you spare everyone that's here today and bless them the best day ever. And... Wish they have fun for whatever they do tomorrow or every day. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. You guys all ready for Christmas? All your Christmas shopping is done, right? Not. <laughs> if you had to go out to the stores yesterday, you recognize most people's Christmas shopping is not done. They are all in the stores. Uh, we, uh, we are blessed, aren't we? We had a, an opportunity yesterday. Uh, there's a Bible study group that adopted a family in the community. And I have to tell you, when you deliver a Christmas to somebody that is thinking they're not going to get one, it is amazing to see their faces. It is awesome to watch them have um, no expectation, be filled with all sorts of expectation, because there's things wrapped and there's things in boxes and there's things all over the place that they just didn't plan on. So. Uh, this, is a, this is a time for giving. It is a time when we recognize all that's been given to us. And we're going to uh, receive our tithes and offerings right now, so we'll have the men come forward. Uh, for those of you who do uh, give an, a year-end gift, the blessing this year is the 31st is a Sunday. So if you're here on New Year's Eve morning, uh, that's the last day to give and have it credited into this calendar year. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask him to bless our offerings. Father, it is with great joy because of the joy of sending and giving us your son, providing a means of salvation, it is with great joy that we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. We give you praise, Father, for the way that you multiply every gift that's given. We thank you for blessing the families that give. When their hearts, Father, are totally sold out to you, it is amazing what goes on in an individual's life. And so we give you praise for that. Bless those who give today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we have some announcements, not the least of which are some birthdays. A couple of weeks ago, Pam Mills had a birthday, but we didn't mention it. Well, she wasn't here last week. So, Pam Mills, happy birthday. Yes. Yes. We have to put everybody on the spot. Uh, Charlotte Schiffer has a birthday. I think she's probably in the cry room back there with the kids. But uh, happy birthday, Charlotte. Uh, Judy Rivard has a birthday. And she is, I won't tell you how old she is. Um, Lori Schultz has a birthday on the 23rd. Yes. And, and Rick Gonzalez has a birthday coming up. All those birthdays this coming week. So if you see them, make sure you help them celebrate. Uh, we're going Christmas caroling today at 3 p.m. And so I'm going to ask you, Tracy, where are you sitting? 
Tracy is somewhere in the back there. She's sitting over there. She has, she has sheets that say the houses that we're going to. We're starting at 3 o'clock because a lot of the seniors that we sing carols to go to bed very early. So we're going to start singing at 3 o'clock uh, so we have a chance to get around to all of them. She has a list of the houses that we're uh, going to, and uh, the first one is where we're meeting to do that. Uh, Christmas Eve Eve service is coming up. That is going to be 5.30 on the 23rd, Eve Eve, the 23rd. So uh, we would love to have you come and join us. It's going to be a fun night of a lot of uh, singing Christmas carols, as well as uh, taking communion and just sharing in fellowship of the family. So we enjoy doing that, and we would love to have you come join us. We have uh, Christmas Eve morning. This, I'm looking forward to this. The kids that were up here, uh, they're going to be doing the service. Um, the teachers, yeah, I know. You don't have to listen to John and I. What a blessing. That's our Christmas gift to you. <laughs> but the, the kids and the children's ministry are going to be presenting a family-style Christmas. Uh, and uh, we welcome you to come around the fireplace. No, we don't have one up here, and we're not building a fire. But we welcome you to come around the fireplace and join us. Uh, and then uh, winter camp fundraiser, you already heard about the car wash. Uh, I got approached by, I think, a half a dozen kids last week. So I hope you brought plenty of money to buy car wash tickets. They make great Christmas gifts, by the way. So uh, go ahead and purchase those and support them. And then one last thing. We're very fortunate. We have a lot of law enforcement that are part of our body. And two of them recognize that as um, young people go off to college or even into high school, that there are a lot of safety concerns that uh, young people are not necessarily clued into. And uh, the parents of these, uh, these kids also are not clued into perhaps what they should be schooling their kids and doing to make sure that they stay safe on campuses. So on the 27th at 6 o'clock, uh, the former chief of police, uh, Richard Gonzalez, as well as one of the uh, serving detectives, uh, Joey Brown, are going to be leading a, um, a, a seminar on how to make sure you stay safe. And uh, this <laughs> in this world right now, education on that subject is not a bad thing at all, is it? So. So if you want to come out to that, if you don't sign up ahead of time or anything, just come. It's a Wednesday night, the 27th, and we'd love to have you come and learn a little bit more about how being safe, okay? Yes. Uh, it's at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. And now, Pastor John. Uh, yes, I was all excited. Uh, special, special baptism, uh, watching Mariah baptize somebody from uh, Mariah. For those that don't know, I had Mariah in my junior high ministry when I first started at Downey First Baptist and just watching her share her faith with everybody. And that's the goal is to make disciples. And we talked about it like generations. So I said, hey, I got a grandkid, so I'm happy uh, about that. And so that's kind of the goal. So we're going to, I'm going to pray and then we're just going to talk about uh, the sermon. Uh, would you please uh, pray with me? Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for an opportunity just to share your word. Lord, um, we love this time of year. And Lord, we just ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear how you just permeate this season with love. And we're thankful that you are described that way in scripture, that God is love, but uh, Lord, how you acted in a loving manner towards people that haven't been acting loving towards you. And so, Lord, we just ask you to um, just, again, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to tell us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I titled uh, this sermon, I Love Christmas. Uh, I, I know um, popular belief to where, you know, Mike celebrates it right after Halloween and so, therefore, Mike loves Christmas more than me, but I have some rules of saying after turkey is eaten, I've been thankful for a month, then I can celebrate Christmas, and I genuinely love Christmas. I really do. It's one of my favorite times of the year, and I know when you're compared to uh, Clark W. Griswold, it's like, are you sure you love Christmas? Because you don't have enough lights on your house. To say you love Christmas, and but I do. I love Christmas. And one of the um, things that we're going to take a look at today is just taking a look at just the word love. And one of the um, really informative, one of the ways to learn about it was especially when it comes to scripture. And we all know that the, the Bible was written in two primary languages, Hebrew and Greek. 
and those particular cultures express things different from uh, English culture and American culture to whatever culture you're kind of from because they had a way of the way they would communicate. And one of the things that we kind of, kind of forget sometimes, we look at scripture through kind of our own lens. And what it's important for us to see in the lens of everybody else of how they would actually attribute things. So like you can learn a lot from a culture and how they use words, and what's important for them for to use words. For example, our culture, if you were to ask us about shoes in particular, Pastor John likes his shoes, but have you have noticed how many words we have for the kind of shoes that we have will tell us how much we value. Like, for example, I'm wearing tennis shoes. Am I playing tennis? No. Right? Uh, but I, but that's what we refer to them. Or you can have them as basketball shoes. Are you playing basketball shoes? No, we just like the style, right? Or they're loafers, or they're penny loafers, and you put the little penny in them. Do you guys remember that? Or what Pastor Mike's wearing? He's a man, and so he's wearing cowboy boots, <laughs> right? And so we all know, right? Those are the ways. And so. You have a way of our culture expressing things differently. You can do the same with automobiles and our culture. is like you can just name automobiles, right? We, some people just would call them a car. But in American culture, no, that is an SUV. No, that is a 4x4. No, that is just a regular standard sedan. Oh, that's one of those commuter cars, right? And then some of you like going, oh, that's an electric car. <laughs> it's not a real car. It doesn't have an engine. Right? Oh, sorry. Right? You guys even make fun of the way it is. So, but in the Greek culture, guess what happens? We have one word. It's like, I love Christmas. Right? And we tend to emphasize that word as to express the kind of love you have towards something. And it's just one of those things in an English culture, we just kind of have that one word, love. But in the Greek, if you want to take the next Go to the next slide. Guess how many words they have? They have around four. Four ways of expressing this affection. Four ways of saying, this is what I'm trying to communicate. And so when you hear the word agape, this is an agape love. This is a one love towards humanity, a kind of a selfless love. And we're going to talk a lot about the agape kind of love. But that's one that's used in scripture quite a bit. The second is the storge love. This is the one for the love of one has towards family members. The storge love to where you can just see a mother's love for her child. As they're holding the child, as we celebrate Christmas, we all kind of sense that's what Mary is feeling at the birth of Christ. The story gave love to where she is pondering all the words in her heart when she's being told what she's been selected for. And she's pondering all that moments to when the shepherds give her news and there she is having baby Jesus in her arms. And people telling her that. That's that storge kind of love. And a lot of us get to celebrate that kind of love during this holiday season. Because one of your favorite aspects is going visiting family that you haven't seen in so long. And all of a sudden, you're just in a good mood. Or some of you, in a bad mood. <laughs> you're like, oh, they showed up. <laughs> right? But for most of us, we enjoy it. You're there with your family, and that puts you in a great mood. That's a story I kind of love to go, and, hey, I missed you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Hey, tell me how you're doing. Let's catch up. That's the story I kind of love, and you just can't help it because that's a part of your celebration of Christmas. You're like being around the family, being around the extended family, being around your friends that became family. That's that story kind of love. The next is the philia kind of love, the brotherly love. Jesus is your, uses this towards his disciples. And that's where we get Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love. Right? We hear that, and that's what they're expressing. And if you've ever seen a miniseries called Band of Brothers, oh my goodness. If you've sat with just that miniseries, A Band of Brothers, you understand this kind of love. 
to where they have experienced so much of the good and bad of this world to when they talk about one of their brothers that was not by blood relation, but they would lay down their life for them in a heartbeat. And in order to just even talking about them, it brings a tear to their eyes because they are like, this is a family bond. This is a family bond that you were a stranger, but until these moments, until this experience, now I would lay down my life for you. And this is what Jesus is telling all his quote unquote disciples. I no longer call you students, but I call you friends, but I call you brothers. This is that kind of love to where he's like, we are connected. And here you have the last one is the Eros kind of love, the romantic kind of love. And I call that, that's the expensive kind of love. (laughs) Right? That's the expensive one. That's the one that gets you on Valentine's Day. That's right. Now, how much are these roses? How much is the chocolate? How much is the gift? How much is the dinner? All right. I love you, babe. Right? Right? That's, that's the expensive kind of love, the arrows, the romantic, the intimacy kind of love. And so here's what the authors of the Bible had at their disposal to try and communicate what God was communicating to them. They're saying, there's this kind of love I want you to understand, and there's kind of ways in which we wanted to do it, rather than you just saying, hey, I love Christmas, versus going, I love Christmas because it means so much to me. The way Mary understood it at that time, there was so much wrapped up in there than versus the way we just kind of use it because we kind of, kind of um, just sanitize that word sometimes. So here's a couple verses for you to understand. We talked about that agape love, and there's an element of self-sacrifice in there. That agape love, the one that you have towards all of humanity to where you're saying, hey, go love your neighbor as yourself, this kind of agape love. But take a look at this for John 3, 16 says, for God so loved, for God so agape the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But the God demonstrates his own agape towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Husbands, agape your wives, just as Christ also agape the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5, 24. Matthew 22, verse 37. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall agape the Lord. There's an element of that. There's an element of self-sacrifice in which God is is essentially saying this is what happens with love in itself. And we're going to take a look at how um, C.S. Lewis kind of breaks down this agape love. If you've ever read this book, and it's called The Four Loves, and basically C.S. Lewis does this. He looks at all those four words. And he categorizes them and he uses them in this way. And so in, instead of like agape, uh, he uses the word charity. And so that's kind of where he's coming from. And instead of storge, he uses affection and friendship, philia, obviously brotherly love. And eros, he just uses eros. And so I really enjoyed this book, uh, partly in the manner of, of one, it helped me understand just people in general, just it's even just relationships in general. And one I'm just going to highlight because this is a little rabbit trail and I get to tell you about it because it's one of those things of just talking about even just that brotherly friendship love. And I understood it a little bit deeper the way he kind of explained it because he talked about how he had a group of friends. He had a group of friends to where there was four of them. And I don't know if you've ever had a social setting to where you've kind of experienced around the same group of friends over time. And those group of friends have a shorthand. They have inside jokes. They have inappropriate jokes sometimes too, right? They have inappropriate jokes or sometimes they can say this, but what he experienced, he goes, when we lost one of our friends and the social dynamic that happened afterwards, he goes, he wasn't fully prepared for 
He goes, because he saw that when them losing one of their f- closest friends, it changed the dynamic to where that one friend could annoy one of their other friends the most. He, whatever he said, he was the only person that could just press that person's button like somebody could. They were the only ones that could do that. And then when they would do that, when that person would get frustrated after that person was poking their buttons, the other person would think that was the best entertainment in the world. It was like, we love watching that person get frustrated, and they had the biggest belly laugh watching this dynamic happen. They're like, oh, watch this. He's going to be poking him, and then he's going to get all frustrated. And then that person's thinking, this is the best show I've ever seen. And they would just delight in each other's company. But now losing that person, they said, I'm no longer going to hear that boisterous laugh because no one else is going to be able to press that button. And then learning also as a young pastor, knowing that in a season in which people are saying goodbye to their closest friends, knowing that friendships have been developed for over decades, These aren't acquaintances. These are the brotherly kinds of love. And there's a different grief that happens when this person says goodbye. We raised our kids together. You don't understand. That person loved my kids as much as I love them. And now I have to say goodbye. And there's a void. There's a hole there. And me being young didn't see that because they're doing the math going, I don't have enough time on this quote unquote planet to develop that same kind of friendship. It's not there. So this is a different kind of a grief. And C.S. Lewis captures that. He captures it in the book. But then he also says this. So to love, as he says this, is to be vulnerable. And I like this kind of the way he approaches it because we always tend to forget this vulnerability aspect of love. This vulnerability aspect to where God is able to say, I'm planning to be vulnerable with my creation. Sometimes we think God doesn't have any quote-unquote skin in the game, but he actually does. He says, there is no escape along the lines as St. Augustine suggests. No along any other lines. There is no safe investment. To love is also to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure you're keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it up carefully around the hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or a coffin of your selfishness. But in the casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. It will become impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternate to the tragedy, or at least the risky of the tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. And what he's essentially saying is this. Love in itself, you are exposed to being hurt. If you say, I'm going to love anything, you are opening yourself to being hurt. So a lot of us know that this is deep-seated equation and says, man, I don't want to play that game. Right? So we essentially say, you know what, we're going to lock it up, we're going to keep people at a distance, and you're going to have theirs so they can't hurt me. And what C.S. Lewis is essentially saying, guess what? That's going to be bad because you're going to guard that heart, and guess what? If if it's sick right now, if it's insecure, guess what? That's all it's going to be, stay there. He's saying, here's the skin in the game, so to speak. God is wrapped up in this. This is one of his character traits to where he says, I'm willing to be exposed. I'm willing to be hurt. I'm willing to have someone say, no, thank you, over this creation. That's what God says. That's his defining, one of his defining character traits when he says, God is love. He is willing to be hurt, to willing to be wounded for us and then we know that and it's interesting for us and i love how c.s lewis continues to go on if you look at the second quote he's talking about charity he goes we all receiving charity there must be something in each of us that cannot be naturally loved 
It's no one's fault if he do not love, do not so love it. Only the lovable can be naturally loved. They are receiving charity, are loved, not because of they themselves are lovable, because love himself is in those who love them. And what C.S. Lewis explains, he explains it this way. He goes, imagine somebody who just recently gets married, the husband, and all of a sudden he's struck with an illness and he cannot do anything and his wife must tend to him. And, and at the very core of that, it, it upsets the husband because they're like, this wasn't a part of the equation. You're not just supposed to, don't really do, do, do it on me. I was supposed to, to contribute to this. And he said, that kind of love messes up with people because we are so used to this idea that we have to be somewhat lovable to be loved. That idea is like saying, you love me because I do this. You love me because I do that. And yet, all of a sudden, what C.S. Lewis is talking about, the kind of love that when God uses, he goes, yeah, I see all of that, and guess what? I'm that one, like that wife who's taking care of you. When you have nothing to offer, I'm that one that's going to do that because don't you see what happened? For the Christmas story tells us this. The Christmas story, when you see these shepherds, are a part of this bigger, greater story to where God says, okay, here's this creation. This is one of my defining traits. I love one another, meaning God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have a perfect relationship with each other, and they are just delightful. Talk about a brotherly love that's there, a sacrificial love that's just within them and their relationships, and they decide to create this world. And they create humanity, the crowning jewel of all creation. And he says, oh, I'm going to set you guys apart. I'm going to put you in a place that's going to allow you to flourish. You're going to have purpose. You're going to have value. You're going to have this wonderful relationship to where you're just going to be my representative in this realm and in this area. And you want to know what they did? And messed it all up. Right? Right? So he puts them in the garden, and he says, hey, I gave you guys a wonderful opportunity to take care of the garden. You didn't want to do that. Now you're outside of the garden. You were never designed to be outside of that garden, but now you are. God, seeing this and going, now he's looking at this. He goes, oh, yeah, but I committed to you. I'm not going to cast you away. I love you. And guess what? Love made him vulnerable to heartbreak, to being rejected. And he sees that, and he sees humanity, and he goes, oh, yeah, here, I'm going to love them this agape kind of love, self-sacrificially. Guess what? I have a plan for you. I'm not going to leave you outside of the garden. I want you back in. In order to do that, guess what? i got to come down and do it myself. And he sees this entire timeline of humanity, entire timeline of humanity, and he's trying to woo them back. And they're like, God, that's awesome. You tell us what to do, but great, go kick rocks. We're going to do it our own way. And he's told them time and time again, he sends them prophet after prophet, king after king, please come back to me. And finally, you see there's a dormant period to where God's no longer sending prophets to his people because they're not listening. And he's like, fine, do it myself. He goes, remember that prophet 700 years prior to this? He says, this Messiah is going to be born. It's like, yeah, but it's a virgin birth. Because I want them to be paying attention. I want them to not miss this. How many here have ever had to remind somebody over and over and over again? How many times have you ever had to just remind someone about a simple text message? Hey, we still on for today? Because they tend to forget. Right? They tend to forget. I don't know if you have friends in that, but I'm that one friend that always gets the reminder text. Right? I'm not joking. Ask, they're, they're out here, but ask the Kelly. They, they send me, it was like, Pastor John, you're on for chapel. I know you're going to forget. Right? They remind me, right? They remind me and keep it reminding me. And God's doing the same thing. Same thing. He's reminding these people over and over. He's like, hey, by the way, this is what's going to happen. Hey, by the way, I told you 700 years ago, hey, it's coming up. It's coming up. And then all of a sudden, boom, stars align, literally align for his birth because he loves 
and he was willing. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. And he goes, you know what? They're worth it. They're worth it. They've been rejecting me this whole time. My people have been rejecting me this whole time, but you know what? They're worth it. I'm going to love them this way. I'm going to love them this way. I'm going to be born. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to be exposed. And in Luke 2, it tells him he grew in stature and wisdom and favor among all men, meaning Jesus lived this humanity. He lived it, and he was exposed to being ridiculed and rejected. And he was hurt by the same people he came to save. And he says, I love them. And he's growing up, and he tells them, and he authenticates his ministry after so many miracles. He said, Jesus, we don't want you. We want the murderer Barabbas. Jesus, knowing full well if he loves his people, he is exposing himself to being vulnerable, to being hurt, to being rejected. And he says, they are worth it. And he grows up and he sees that. Can you imagine what that must have felt like when your people in which you came to save, they said, we don't want you, we want that guy. And that's what they did. And they're like, that guy's going free. And all of a sudden, and that Roman guard is picked up his hammer. And he goes, they are worth it. While even on the cross, he's looking at those who are hurling insults at them. And he's looking at it because that love is exposed. It's vulnerable. It's bleeding on that cross, and he says, you are worth it. I love you. He agapes the world that he sent his son self-sacrificially. He's willing to be exposed. Jesus did not wrap up his heart in a casket. He knew how much it was going to hurt. And he says, sign me up. Just like Isaiah was, uh, in that, hey, send me, send me. I love them. I can't help but love them. And you see, this is what the shepherds were celebrating. They were on the trailer end of it. They got exposed. They were outside and just doing their shepherd thing with some sheep. And then all of a sudden, as these heavenly hosts showed up, they're like, hey, remember that prophecy that we talked about 700 years ago? Oh, you guys weren't there, were you? No, you weren't there. But, hey, you heard about it, right? They're like, yeah, that one. That's tonight? I didn't get a memo. <laughs> Can you imagine? But that was them. They were like, I didn't. This was tonight? Did you know? Did you? What, and why are you even telling us? We're not even supposed to know. We're just shepherds. We're not even anyone important. They're like, yeah, get over here. Go, Boom. Can you imagine them on the way just running? It was like running, and all of a sudden they find out. They're like, hey, this is what they told us. This baby here is going to be the Messiah. This is God who loves us. God with us, Emmanuel. And here's what they do. The shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all the things they heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I love Christmas. These last two things is I love Christmas. They're wrapped up in this. Contrary to popular belief, just because I celebrate it after Thanksgiving, I still love Christmas. Okay? I know Christmas music is one of these things. That I get to listen to for an extended period of time. And I will still listen to it till the first of the year, just so you know. <laughs> just so you know. I listen to Christmas music all the way to the first, maybe the second. As long as Coast plays it, I listen to it. <laughs> all right? I don't know if you guys know that, but I still do. So I love it. But here's the one thing I want you to know is this. Why are you letting that word carol take away from what that Christmas music actually is. It's a worship song. 
It's a worship song. The shepherds got it. They were sitting there praising them. Don't let that word carol strip you from what the shepherds experienced on Christmas. They experienced genuine worship. And when that is a part of your Christmas traditions, the Christ worship aspects, why do you think we keep singing them? And we have a wonderful tradition here at Main Street Church to where we sing on Christmas Eve. Silent night. Silent night. But if you think about it, that silent night is blasted in our culture. In the American culture, it's one of their hymns that they hold on to. They're like, this is part of the American tradition, silent night. But that silent night is only talking about Christ. Because it was made for a worship service. A person penned those words to highlight Christ. And it's blasted all through our radios. And they sing it over and over, and I love it. I love O Holy Night. I love O Holy Night. It's one of my favorite Christmas worship songs. It's not a carol, so to speak. It's a worship song. It, I'm like, man, whoever pinned that, man, I get blessed every time I hear it. And I don't care who sings it, because there's like 70 people who sing it on coast. I'm like, how do I like that version? I don't like this version. But here's what I wanted to leave you with is this. So I, I was listening to a friend, and that's why the crock pot's on here. Because on Christmas Eve, you have a tradition of going to Christmas Eve service, right? And so a friend, he was a PK, a pastor's kid. And he always, he has a different memory of Christmas Eve, for those that know. Christmas Eve is a little bit times where it's, busy. It's a different service. There's a lot of planning that goes on. He goes, but also, growing up, he understood that his dad wasn't going to be, quote unquote, right home after Christmas Eve service. His mom wasn't going to be able to prepare a lot of the traditional Christmas Eve meals because they're going to be at church. And so what they would do is they would have a couple crock pots sitting at home. And the mom kind of felt a little guilty because, you know, they would have these little almost hors d'oeuvres kind of Christmas Eve meal. They would pull them out in there. And then he talked to me about, like, that experience. He was like, oh, yeah, this was a kind of our tradition because we would have to run home. And then we, there was always a little bit of hustle and bustle. He goes, but when his dad retired, his dad retired, his mom goes, oh, okay, cool. Now I'm going to do the traditional Christmas Eve Right? I'm going to get to do the ham, the, the, the mashed potatoes. You guys do that? Okay, cool. Because we do some tamales. I'm just saying. It's different. <laughs> it's different. But, um, but yes, all, so all the traditional stuff, right? And so she was ready to prepare for that Christmas Eve one. And then they were like, hey, where's our crockpot stuff? The kids go, no, 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 you don't. That, that's our Christmas tradition. That, that's what reminds us of Christmas because it anchored them to saying, listen, our Christmas Eve, guess what it revolved around? It revolved around a worship service. Our Christmas Eve didn't necessarily revolve around all these other things. It revolved around worship service. And that reminded us of that. We liked that part. We liked that. So mom, get your crock pots out. And give us what we want. And it was super sweet. And I remembered him telling me, relaying that story. Because guess what? The reason why I love Christmas is because so does God. He loves Christmas. He can't help but love Christmas. Because that was his demonstration of love. He loves it to where he come and he embodied where it says God became flesh and dwelt among us, where it talks about he is Emmanuel, he is with us. Don't you understand when you have your storge kind of Christmas with your family and Jesus is like, hey, I've had that too. I've had that with my brothers. And I love that. 
I love that kind of Christmas. And then all of a sudden, and when you gather around on a Christmas Eve service, and guess what? And you sing Silent Night, and there's worship, and Jesus goes, I love that Christmas too. I love that Christmas too, where Pastor John sings off key. Right? He loves that to where that worship is a part of Christmas. It's a part of Christmas, and he loved that. And for us, guess what? Why do you think we go caroling, quote unquote? You're a bunch of little worshipers singing worship songs to some people who need to hear it. That's why it's a blessing. Have you ever noticed when people show up outside of someone's home and they start singing Christmas worship songs, all of a sudden their demeanor goes a little bit up. They're like, oh my gosh, spirit of joy. Spirit of joy. That's why we do it, to see the look on people's faces, and we have little worship songs, little worship concerts for them, singing worship carols. Just so you know, 3 p.m. today, you're invited. But for us, thinking about that, going, when you hear that, when people are going, oh, I love Christmas, I want you to be thinking, yeah, so does God. God loves Christmas too, amen? amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much that we just have another opportunity to just be in your presence. Lord, we can just sit um, and dwell and think about how much you have used the word love in Greek. And we haven't even touched Hebrew, what you just said. You love your creation, you have loved your creation when the creation rejected you and they had nothing to offer. But Lord, sometimes we think that we're going to get to the end of your love. And Lord, it talks about even in the Greek, the play Roma, to where there's an overflow. It's one of those fountains that just keep overflowing and your love for us, and how much you love this part of the year in which we get to meditate and prepare. And Lord, we have this aspect in the spring called Lent for 40 days. We get to prepare for your resurrection. But Lord, even in the winter, we get to prepare to celebrate your birth for as long as we want to. And so, Lord, we just ask that you open up our hearts to where some of us were preparing them for the casket to protect it. But Lord, you open up our hearts so we can receive the blessing of what you have for us. So again, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to communion today, the Lord does ask us to do, do this in remembrance of him. It's a time when we uh, are a time of have a time of quietness with him reflection thanking him for who he is and what he has done he is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son Jesus and our sins are forgiven with that we remember him great as our Lord and greatly to be praised. Let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, what you have done, and that you are in control of everything. For this, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in everything we say and do. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, This is my body, which is given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Amen. 
Also in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Take and drink. Scripture also tells us that when they had finished, they sang and went out. sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing sing joy to the world joy to the world the Savior reigns let men their soul sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. And he rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the name his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love amen lord jesus we just thank you for the joy that you offer us um god and um, I just pray, Lord, that if anybody here today um, is not feeling that joy from um, different circumstances in their life right now, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that um, a friend could come to them. Um, you always work your way into things, Lord, and um, I really think that um, you have a purpose for everyone, Lord. So, Lord, let's just be joyful the rest of the season, Lord, in you. We love you, and we pray this in your name. Amen. We are dismissed. <laughs>